so good morning everyone it's a beautiful morning in jaipur again i'm telling you it's turning into bangalore and very soon you wouldn't have to go to bangalore to enjoy the weather so with that let's start let me know who all are there and i am on time so who all are there good morning afreen uh good morning radhima can you guys see me am i audible and visible all right i hope i'm audible and visible now so with that uh, good morning everyone i'm sidhi bangar uh, i graduated from bit mestra and appeared for four mains and an interview and did my post graduation in hr from xlr jamshedpur my code is sbus or sp sidhi you can use whichever you want for a 10% off on your course fee or any uh, for any subscription under the upsc csc category uh good morning afreen and ridhima i guess you are there and you can follow me on the unacademy app and message me there in case you have any doubts in case you want to connect with me i'll surely revert uh folks uh, i want to know how did you uh, find the marathon classes because i'm planning to have another two marathon sessions this uh, weekend i mean the coming saturday and sunday so four to five hours classes each maybe we'll do some 50 to 60 questions something like that uh, starting from 11:30 so we'll continue till 3:34 so we'll be doing some 50 60 questions and uh how do you feel about it let me know if you enjoyed the last marathon sessions then we can have two marathon sessions on saturday sunday and another two marathon sessions on the coming weekend in between then i will not have a class on th uh, thursday and friday i'll give you two days preparation time and then we can meet up on saturday and sunday uh let me know in the chat section how does that look to you okay so under the plus courses you get daily live classes you can chat with the educator ask your doubts answer polls all while the class is going on so it's a very live experience we also have live test and quizzes so that whatever you have learned you can test or hone your preparation and most importantly the courses are structured with the examination syllabus to get you the best edge for preparing for the civil services and one subscription under either the plus or the iconic gives you access to all the courses that have been recorded previously they're all there on the website you can go and access the best courses that are there from whichever educator you want to choose we have somewhere around 700 educators teaching you just for civil services so you can pick and choose which person you're most comfortable actually studying from and most importantly you also have access to all the live sessions for any any course be it in the optional be it the prelims course be it the newspaper etc etc whatever is there on the unacademy platform everything is open to you with the plus or the iconic subscriptions all right so afreen is okay with the marathon sessions others please let me know what do you think about the marathon sessions if everybody is okay with the marathon sessions then instead of having a regular class on thursday and friday we'll directly meet on saturday and sunday and go for the marathon sessions 50 to 60 questions each uh with that under the unacademy iconic program it's a unique program for freshers and perseverant aspirants so apart from the benefits of plus that i already talked about structured schedule unlimited practice test series and live classes the most important feature is getting a personal coach somebody who stays with you handles all your smallest meanest or the major doubts about the exam daily mains question and a uh, answer practice this becomes the most important factor in clearing the civil services exam because without the writing in q and a format which is the exact format of the exam it is very difficult to actually ace the exam that's where majority of the participants falter and in fact if you ace this part of the exam that you write very good questions and answers in the mains exam your selection is kind of 90% guaranteed because then again your interviews are whimsical but you have scored enough in the mains examination that's a straight ticket to the civil services and study planner which becomes all the more important given that now there will be less time available for you for the mains and the interviews and a personalized feedback sessions 
whenever whenever the person who is your coach deems fit or whenever you deem fit you can interact with him on telegram whatsapp normal calls video calls or maybe meet up if you people are in the same city so with that the iconic is for 64000 for one year and 99000 for 24 months you can use my code sbus to get an instant 10% off on the iconic subscription and for the plus courses the one year fee is 44000 and the two year fee is 64000 again you can use my code sbus for getting an instant 10% off which makes it 39600 for one year and 57600 for two years with that uh, choose wisely choose an academy and choose iconic and use my code sbus for any subscriptions under the upsc csc category so good morning everyone this is a snapshot of my live classes which kind of happen every day at 8:30 pm if they are not happening you will not get the notification on the an academy app the only days they are not happening is when i am ill otherwise these sessions happen every night at 8:30 pm this is a snapshot from my september 7 class it's a prelims mini mock test series for 1 hour we do so it happens on the an academy platform you are free to join with that we'll start uh good morning shantini good morning afreen good morning ridhima so uh guys let me know your views on the marathon session i'm planning to have a marathon session on saturday and sunday so by the end of the class please let me know if you guys are okay with that then instead of having regular sessions on thursday and friday we will have a proper marathon session like we had earlier on saturday and sunday doing around 50 to 60 questions in each of these sessions so our weekends will be pretty fruitful and i think we'll be completing in 3 to 4 hours so it wouldn't take more than that time all right so the ground rules for the class very simple feel free to be wrong you need not skip any questions but now i want you to push yourself more to get the answers right because prelims is just around the corner and obviously enjoy your sessions it's a wonderful morning here and i hope the weather is as pleasant as it is here at your place with that let's begin question number 1 on your screens so all of you who are here please let me know afreen ridhima shantini is here who else is here 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer All right, the time starts now. Afreen you might want to read the question again to you uh because it's not option number C Radhima and Afreen it's not option number C read the option number 1 again we are talking about minor planets right we are not talking about planets planets so minor planets are actually small that's why the gravity cannot pull them into a spherical shape they are not large enough for gravity to pull them into spherical shape So option number one is incorrect. Your correct option is option number B, two only. Names of celestial bodies are finally approved by a committee at the IAU or International Astronomical Union. So Radhima changed her answer later to B. Yes, the correct answer is B and not C. Don't take the questions lightly. Is that okay? This was actually in news regarding the name of naming of a minor planet to Pandit Jasraj's name. who recently passed away he had this planet named after him so what are the rules for naming planets so usually for large bodies it's the iau which gives the name however for smaller system bodies i don't know how many uh, of you have actually watched have you guys watched the big bang theory because it's easier for me to explain it that way so there was an astrophysicist raj in that he was an indian he and his 
his uh, his uh, female friend penny they discover a planet or an object astronomical object and then they can name it so for smaller solar system bodies the discoverer has the privilege to suggest the name so and they can actually suggest the name this privilege lies there for 10 years however there are certain rules by which you can answer these names you cannot just randomly name anything it's okay abhishek so talking about it how do you actually name these uh, even if somebody is given the privilege of naming them so first of all a provisional name is given which actually consists of two letters of the alphabet you can choose and the name has the year of discovery and uh, followed by two numbers so when we come when we talk about pandit uh, jasrad's minor planet name that was given the name 2006 because it was discovered in 2006 vp was the two letters that were given followed by two numbers 32 they're all randomly given and then after that a final name is given up so what are the requirements for that final number the final name should have at least 16 characters or less so less than equal to 16 characters in your name it should be non offensive and should not be similar to an existing name right and if you want to suggest the name of a political or military leader that can only happen after 100 years of their death right so we can't do it before 100 years of their death and the same applies for a political or military event for example you want to uh, name it after say black friday then you actually have to have 100 years passed after that you can actually put that name so that there is no controversy names of pets or names of commercial nature are discouraged you can put them but they are usually discouraged and there can be restrictions depending on where the body is located for example new objects discovered beyond neptune are supposed to be given names of creation deities that means if you are discovering objects in the solar system which are found in the neptunian desert or after the neptune they are supposed to be given greek names or names of or names of creation deities like brahma vishnu or something like that if you are an indian if you are somebody from rome somebody from greek then you can give the names of your respective deities is that okay so that is how the naming convention is followed please remember this because pandit jasraj just passed away astronomy is an important part and naming is one of the favorite topics of civil services they've already asked about naming of the cyclones so this cannot be far away abhishek that i cannot help it because i am actually watching my youtube video and it looks just fine so can you please refresh can you refresh again because if i am looking at it on my cell phone it looks just fine to me all right question number 2 on your screens this is an interesting question so 15 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer All right, let's begin. ED has been in news of late a lot of times. So let's see what do you know about ED? And read the questions very carefully. All right, Abhishek. so anybody who has an answer ridhima has answered okay anybody else i'll wait for another 5 seconds actually uh no the answer is not a ridhima and afri the answer is d both 1 and 2 are incorrect pmla is okay but it is not fcra it's not foreign contribution act it is fema on which the ed acts which is foreign exchange management act and they both are different acts so your primary objective 
of enforcement directorate is to deal with fema which is foreign exchange management act all right and the prevention of money laundering act 2002 and yes it does not come under department of economic affairs but it comes under department of revenue actually my father is in this department and he has worked with ed so it comes under the department of revenue uh no ashwath kumar it's not c it's option number d both these statements are incorrect that's why i said read the statements carefully all right coming here your foreign exchange management act was revised so your original foreign exchange management act actually came somewhere in 1976 1973 all right it was again revised to 1999 and so the penalties or the punishments were actually reduced in the foreign exchange management act because the original fema is a emergency era legislation all right so what is the difference between fcra and fema are you guys still with me because i am only seeing two people replying even when nine people are watching people should at least answer the questions what is happening why are you guys not replying or why are you guys not answering the questions what is wrong look if you're not interested in this session we as well as very much close this session and shut it off because i don't want to teach to a people who are not interested in listening or participating in the class the questions have no meaning if nobody is participating honestly i have better things to do and you have better things to do so let's not waste each other's time is that okay so can i please know if everybody is here if you are interested in replying then only i shall progress otherwise i am only speaking and i am not getting a response uh i really don't feel like teaching because unless everybody got it correct then there was no point teaching it but as i can clearly see it was a very easy thing yet people are not even reading the question properly so you want me to close the session i can close the session and we can leave yes afreen you and rhythma are replying but i don't know who else is there because i don't get any replies and that's exasperating me so if you want me to shut down the session i am pretty much okay with that but i want everybody to answer i mean i'm quite sure that you're not 100% prepare for your prelims so is it not good that you reply i get to know whether you're doing it correctly or incorrectly and then we proceed otherwise you can go visit there are thousand of websites available online go do the questions and prepare why do you come to the class is that understood because i want everyone to reply otherwise next three questions and we are done with the session i have no time and no energy to waste upon people who are not interested in the class honestly i have better things to do so i should get a reply from all those who are watching there are 9 or 10 people watching 9 or 10 people should reply otherwise the everyone in the class suffers and i am quite, i know you quite capable of preparing yourself go and prepare but get the questions right first all right okay so coming back to this one the difference between fcra remember fcra which is foreign contributions uh, regulation act it is actually related to your pm cares fund your pm cares fund does not come under fema but fcra fcra is usually used for charitable purposes it is used by the ngos most of the times right and your fema is usually for commercial purposes so if any grant is given under fema that is for commercial borrowing purposes and it comes under ministry of finance so fema comes under ministry of finance and that is why your ed come which comes under department of revenue ministry of finance actually regulates fema your fcra on the other hand comes under the ministry of home affairs and money given under the fcra is for charity or social work all right okay so this is what i wanted to talk about however uh, why this entire thing has been in news for a while is uh, primarily because ed has been looking at a lot of uh, cases in which ngos are involved right 
and uh, NGOs and the commercial entities. So a lot of commercial entities get foreign funding and a lot of NGOs get foreign funding which is still unaccounted for. So they are supposed to register under FCRA so that the Ministry of Home Affairs can actually look into how they are getting their funding. So if you remember there was a famous case of Tista Sitalwad. She is still not allowed in India. She is actually, uh, sorry, PM Care Fund is under FCRA. Uh, PM Care Fund Ronnie is under FCRA. So it is justifiable because it is a charity based organization registered under the Charities Act 1908. So it does not come under FEMA, it comes under FCRA. That is what I was trying to say. Now the problem with both these acts is they are actually emergency era regulations. So of late there has been a huge UN cry to actually uh, modify them and make them more appropriate to the current circumstances. The penalties need to be reduced and the law should be such that the legality is maintained without compromising on the liquidity that comes into the nation. Good morning Anand. So uh, this is what I wanted to talk about. I will actually share this article with you. Actually, I, I this is a 2015 article, but I will share this article with all of you. I'll share it in the evening uh, unacademy session. I want you guys to actually go and know the difference between FCRA and uh, FEMA. All right. So your FCRA, your FEMA is actually, um, your FCRA is about controlling what kind of foreign contribution comes inside India. And your Foreign Exchange Management Act is under monitoring. You are monitoring what kind of foreign exchanges are going between commercial entities. All right. Yes, Ronnie. Uh, RTI cannot be filed upon it because it's not a public authority. So they are excluded by the RTI. All right. Yeah, PM Care is excluded by the RTI. That's what I'm saying, na, Abhishek. PM Care is excluded by the RTI. Because it is a charity organization, it is not a public authority. It is not using any budgeted money. So it is excluded by the RTI. That is what the Supreme Court judgment said. What I am saying is, it does come under Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. So all the NGOs come under it. All right. Okay. Let's start with this question. Anybody else wants to answer this? All right. Uh, I just received two correct answers as of now. Riddhima and Anand have answered it correctly. Yes, it is Sea of Japan. Uh, it's not the Yellow Sea. It's not the East China Sea. Uh, yes, Aswat Kumar, it's C, Ronnie's, uh, sorry, Ronnie and Aswat Kumar, it's not C, Sivranjini, it's not A, it is B, Sea of Japan. Sea of Japan is also called the East Sea. It is bounded by Japan and Sakhalin Islands. Sakhalin Islands, we have already done. Sakhalin Island is where ONGC Videsh Limited is actually looking for oil. Sakhalin Island is a part of the Kamachatka Peninsula. We have discussed the Kamachatka Peninsula when we were discussing the map, right? We have the Kuril Trench emanating from here. So in the Kamachatka Peninsula is your Sakhalin Islands where you have ONGC Videsh looking for oil in Russia. That's one of our major investments in Russia. And yes, your the hint for it actually comes from why it cannot be the East China Sea because it is bounded by Russia and Korea on the Asian mainland to the west. If you're talking about Russia, then definitely that sea has to be the Sea of Japan. It cannot be the Yellow Sea because it's bounded by China on three sides. And East China Sea, of course, it cannot be the East China Sea. All right. So by elimination alone, if you look at the third statement, you can do it. And if you know that Sakhalin Islands are in the uh, Russia, then you can eliminate this and this becomes Sea of Japan. 
yes kama chatka is in russia and this hanging area which is called kama chatka peninsula has the sakhalin islands here these are the sakhalin islands you will find them on the map uh, abhishek so this is where we have made our ongc videsh investments all right so this is the sakhalin island here this is russia and japan this entire island of japan then you have north korea and here you have vladivostok do you remember we have discussed this so north korea when we were discussing the boundary of north korea north korea has a boundary with china a small boundary with russia and a demilitarized zone with south korea we have already discussed this question day before yesterday so this entire sea of japan actually is here uh, you have the anaiwa bay which actually takes you to sea of okotsk you have the tatar strait going ahead and you have the korea strait from where you enter the sea of japan so when we were talking about going from chennai to ladi vostok that's when i discussed that we'll go through the east china sea and we'll go through the korea strait and then we'll go to russia the ladi vostok region east china sea is a little below so they are philippines below japan is your philippines do you remember have you seen the world map roni we discussed it on the world map and the kuril islands that i was talking about so your kama chatka peninsula is here and from there you emanate uh, emanates your kuril islands all right yes abhishek station of trans siberian railway the world's longest railway system is ladi vostok ladi vostok to st petersburg all right st petersburg is the original area where we are sending goods from mumbai to st petersburg right now which takes approximately 40 days by sea all right now we want to send it from chennai to ladi vostok we have already discussed that when we discussed eastern economic forum remember abhishek and everybody else okay let's come to question number 4 this is an interesting question i also have downloaded the app so i will show you how it actually looks like so 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer Sivranjini what are you trying to answer All right your time starts now Well, Abhishek is right. Actually, both A and B are correct. So, option number C is correct. Afri, it's option number C. The Audio Odigos app was actually launched by Ministry of Culture. It comes under the scheme, uh, this one, Adopt a Heritage. Have you heard about the scheme, Adopting a Heritage scheme, which was launched in 2018? So this app was actually launched in October 19. Yes. So Ashwath Kumar is also correct. Rest everyone it's option number C. Both 1 and 2 are correct. I will just show you how the app actually looks like. All right. Shivranjini and Roni are also correct. So this is here. This is I have installed the app. This is how the app actually looks like. Wait. this is the audio odigos app so this is a snapshot of my phone all right now this is how you actually when you go inside the app
So the first page is where you get the option for cities. Under the cities, you can go and select which monument do you want to listen about. So it's like a virtual tour guide. All right. This is here. You select the city. Then they'll take it to you, Red Fort, Hawaii Storm, whatever you want to look at. And then after that, say for example, I have selected Dhola Veera, which is in Gujarat. Instead of Delhi, I selected the city of Dhola Veera, Gujarat. So they, you have synopsis, description and podcast. So it's like a virtual tour guide, which you can hear. And they have got some really good information. So I suggest if you are doing art and culture, you can go and listen to these audios. It will take very less time not more than an hour for you and it will give you very valuable information. In fact, to show you the same, I'll just show you uh, one of the recordings on Dhola Veera itself. All right. So just hang in there. Can you guys see this? If you can see this, I'll show you the first recording. I hope you can see this. Uh, Abhishek, as of now, there are only four or five cities. So there are 12 sites there. Only 12 sites are there. All right. So you guys can see it. Uh, Ministry of Culture, October 2019, Ridhima. This is here. I'm going to play introduction to Dhola Veera. Hello and welcome to Dhola Vira. Though it might not look like much It today, is a free app. This was once a thriving civilization that existed between 3000 and 1800 BCE. This was the Harappan or the Indus Valley Civilization. This ancient site was discovered by Jagat Pati Joshi of the Archaeological Survey of India, ASI, in 1967. But excavations were started only in 1989 under R.S. Bisht and went on till 2005. So, if you want to listen to the audio, you can listen to the audio whenever you guys are free. Or you can simply read the synopsis. They are given in less than 200 words. So, it gives you pretty much important information. So, in less than an hour, you can cover 12 important historical sites of India if you go on this app. So, I think it's a pretty good, good source of art and culture if you want to do that. Is that okay? All right. So, we'll move on to the next question. Question number five. Another 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. This is a repeated question. Yes, this is pretty good. So this is a repeated question. So I hope you get this correct. All right. So let's start. 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. All right, your time begins now. This is something we've already done, both on YouTube and on the Unacademy app. Hello, Naveen. Okay, so I'm getting a couple of answers here. Abhishek, it's not B only, it's actually uh, C. Anant is correct. Both the options are correct here. Unlike commercial banks, uh, your urban cooperative banks are only partly regulated by RBI. I will tell you how. So option number one is correct. And unlike commercial banks, which are structured as joint stock companies, your urban cooperative banks are cooperatives with their members carrying unlimited liability. So option B is also correct. All right. So only three people have answered me correctly. Anand, Naveen and Ashwat Kumar. Sivranjani and Roni also. Yes, Abhishek. 
uh, it's a repeated question because it is important to remember this one all right so this one question i have taken to be repeated uh, so that we can actually do a revision also now coming to it and abhishek if it is a repeated question then you should have got it correct right but you got it incorrect so i think it proves my point that we actually need to revise our question so that we don't make the mistakes in the prelims all right the answer is option number c both are correct so first thing when you talk about uh, basically when you talk about cooperative banks they are actually the concept is that they are formed by a community so that they can uh, you know lend out money to each other it's like a glorified sg or self help group now your credit cooperatives are actually classified into two urban cooperative banks and rural cooperative banks and the urban cooperative banks are again further classified into two which is scheduled banks and non scheduled banks scheduled banks are those which are listed under the rbi act 1934 and the others are non scheduled banks now coming to the difference between commercial banks and cooperative banks so unlike your commercial banks your urban cooperative banks are only partly regulated by the rbi how because their banking operations are regulated by the rbi that means the capital adequacy ratio the risk control lending norms they are all controlled by the rbi however if there is a distress or if there is a management problem then the registrar of cooperative societies either under the central or the state government that takes care of it so only partly regulated by rbi the second point is your commercial banks are structured as joint stock companies what do you mean by joint stock companies that means they are listed on the exchange people can buy shares and the liability regarding the profitability or the loss of the company is limited to the amount of shares they have invested or shares that they have bought for however when you come to urban cooperative companies since their cooperatives people have given their stakes people have put their money into it so not only they are borrowers they are also the shareholders so they have unlimited liability whatever losses accrue whatever whichever kind of losses accrue it is a loss for everyone so that's the distinction the first is ucbs are partially regulated by rbi however the commercial banks are completely regulated by rbi the second is your commercial banks are joint stock companies your ucbs are unlimited liability companies and when you talk about joint stock companies they are limited liability companies and the third distinction is that in commercial banks the borrowers are not the stakeholders however in the urban cooperative banks your borrowers can double up as shareholders all right with that let's come to question number 6 it has a interesting historical overtone all right so your time starts now this actually came in the indian express we recently had the uh, urdu conference in india about which we have already done the question anand actually uh, i will be discussing this too big to fail size of the banks so as of now no the sizes are not too big to fail there is a certain bucket list which the rbi puts over and rbi actually declares to big to fail banks so that is sbi hdfc and ici as of now and icici and hdfc are also not in the very high bucket list it is sbi so their size is not comparable comparable so that's why they are not still in the category of too big to fail the bucket list or the uh, parameters have to be met which i think i'll be discussing in the an academy session today i already have a question on that all right anand okay so only afreen and ashwath kumar have answered me correctly all right the option is a amir khusro it was in news when we were talking about urdu so what happens is in chandigarh university they were trying to combine the department of urdu with the department of foreign languages so that is when the entire uh, debate arose that urdu is actually not a foreign language urdu is an indian language very much an indian language so to actually prove their point they quoted amir khusro from the book ghurrat al kamal it's his third book so it actually the book's name actually means the poet perfection 
it is in this book that he describes what is the difference between a mystic a poet a writer so he clarifies that differences here and when we talk about the last three they are also sufi saints your shah amanat is a sufi saint from bengal he was very popular in chittagong all right and that was the late mughal era after aurangzeb so we can't pinpoint a mughal emperor to his times abdur rahman dehlvi was the founder of qadri order which is a sufi order in delhi he established it in delhi and he was during the time of shah jahan all right and mir mukhtar akhtiyar he this guy he was during the time of aurangzeb so he was a very well known sufi saint mir mukhtar akhtiyar he was during the time of aurangzeb so these are their timelines is that okay uh actually anand they already have uh their sizes are limited if they go for a, another certain size or a bigger size rbi already has norms around that urdu is not national language abhishek listen to me properly i'm not saying it's a national language it's an indian language it has a place in the constitution you're already aware of this right part 17 languages schedule 8 22 languages of india right so it is there uh, talking about anant your question so rbi has norms around that when it starts to get bigger they have further capital adequacy norms or risk control norms however the distress in the management is still taken care of by the registrar of cooperative societies because the law defines it an unlimited liability is yes that's a problem and that's why they swim together and sink together that's the nature of a cooperative society so you can't actually change that all right is that okay anand does that answer your question yeah it's a scheduled language it's a national language sorry it's an indian language so basically the debate was around whether or not it's an indian language they said it's a foreign language so they actually quoted ghurrat al kamal so in that uh, amir khusro in his book ghurrat al kamal has quoted that masood lahori a renowned poet who was born in lahore in 11th century has composed poetry in hindavi urdu is also called hindavi dehlvi or dakhani so that is the reason they say that urdu has very well originated in punjab and lahore and before partition of course it was a part of the greater punjab and in fact the grammar the verb the tenses of urdu are very much like the hindi language so even if some root words are from persian and arabic language languages they were changed into urdu language in india so that's why it if if you talk about urdu it is very much an indian language and it is also called hindustani hindavi dehlvi and rekhta and he said if you talk about the script people said that urdu is written from right to left so the argument given by others was that or the cultural experts was that even the punjabi shahmukhi language it is also written from right to left but that does not make it any less indian so that is the reason they said that it should be included as an indian language it should have a separate department it should be given adequate respect and it should not be merged with other foreign languages urdu is not foreign to us it is very much indian and they also talked about that the punjabi shahmukhi language has is written in persian script just like urdu is written in persian script all right Uh, good morning rosy nepali is there in uh, uh, this the indian schedule that is that is very for different reasons abhishek see whenever you are adding languages to the eighth schedule india being a very very diverse country there are very different reasons to do so for example when we talked about dogri now dogri is a language which is a very niche language spoken by a particular region only yeah rosy must be knowing that pretty well so nepal to add that languages because we have roti beti ka rishta nepal was nepal was a very very much part of the indian subcontinent so how can you separate it a lot of nepalis are working here a lot of indians are working in nepal we have open boundaries so what's the problem what's the harm all right let's come to question number 
this is the easiest one so 30 seconds to answer it Uh, no, Anand, uh, not that Dogri. We are actually talking about the language from West Bengal. So, when we were discussing that Bodo wala community wala issue, we discussed that. Sorry, not Dogri, I am talking about the Bodo language. My bad. Anand, I am talking about the Bodo language. So, that was added as the first tribal language. All right. Yeah, this was the easiest one. So, protection of life and personal liberty according to procedure established by law is also given to foreigners on the Indian soil. Prohibition of discrimination on grounds of religion, race, blah, 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 not given to foreign citizens. Matters of public uh, employment, pretty obvious answer, not given to them. And to practice or carry out any profession, not given to them. Right? So, this was the easiest one. So, I'm not discussing it. Yes, Nani, tell me. What is the doubt? So, everybody got it uh, correct. Tell me, Naveen, what is your doubt? Question number 8 on your screens. Alright. So, your time starts now. Yes, Naveen, it was there. There was a judgment, right? The right to internet wala. All right, so who is answering this one? No, it has been declared by the Supreme Court. I think it came on 10th of January. Uh, that, uh, that ruling came in January, right? It has been declared by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court made it official, if I am not wrong. Yes, Rudhima. Okay, so... Neelam, Anand, Abhishek, Naveen, Ashwat Kumar uh, and Sivranjani. All of you are correct. It's Bureau of Energy Efficiency. It is not option D. It looks very plausible option but it is not so because we are talking about electric vehicles charging infrastructure. So that has been given to Bureau of Energy Efficiency. The mandate for them is that we should have at least one charging station to be available in a 3 to 3 kilometer grid in the cities and one charging station at every 25 kilometers on both sides of highways and roads. So, these are the new guidelines. This was given by Ministry of Power. So, they amended the electric vehicle charging guidelines and specifications. So, in the grid of 3 kilometers to 3 kilometers, all right, there you have to have a, at least one charging station and one charging station at every 25 kilometers on both sides of highways and roads. And for intercity travel, you have to have fast charging stations to be installed at every 100 kilometers. That is the mandate that has been given to Bureau of Energy Efficiency, which has also been nominated as the central nodal agency to facilitate installation of charging infrastructure. All right. Yeah, because Abhishek, your fundamental rights have reasonable restrictions. Abhishek, you can't ask these kind of questions now. I mean, prelims is not even 30 days now. You can't ask ma'am why it was shut down when it's a fundamental right. There are reasonable restrictions placed on every single fundamental right. Yes? Okay. Let's go to question number 9. This question is not for information. This question is how to do a question. If you know... Even one point in this question, you can directly eliminate the others. So, this question is supposed to be done by elimination. Hmm. 
वेरी वेल धीरज थैंक यू ओके आई थॉट यू वर टेलिंग मी कि मैम वाई डिड दे एच सी शट डाउन ऑल राइट फाइन इट्स ओके लेट्स प्रोसीड या दैट हैपन्स नाउ दे आर स्टिल नॉट गिविंग द इंटरनेट टू जम्मू एंड कश्मीर स्टिल एंड दैट्स अ मैटर ऑफ कंसर्न बट वॉट कैन वी डू रीजनेबल रिस्ट्रिक्शंस इन द नेम ऑफ सॉवरिटी इंटेग्रिटी यूनिटी ऑफ इंडिया एंड पीस ah uh, okay guys can you do you understand what dark matter is about because only one person has answered it to me correctly uh, no not even one person has answered it to me correctly can you guys please read it again not even one person has answered it correctly you want to take another chance that actually clearly demarcates that a and d are not correct and even c is not correct so it's actually b read this sentence again dark matter possesses strong interaction with normal matter do you understand that we are actually finding it very difficult to uh, have the presence of dark matter we are running a lot of experiments to discover dark matter where is it how does it interact what does it do we know we have the hypothesis that 90% of the universe is dark matter right but we are still trying to find it yes no no abhishek it's okay it's okay so if you are talking about dark matter possesses strong interaction with the normal matter no it does not that's why i said read the question it can be done directly by elimination you are trying to find something right which you cannot find because it is not find it it cannot be found very easily because it it is not behaving normally that's why you're not able to find it so since it is not interacting normally with no, normal matter like is the case of neutrinos also that's why you have that neutrino observatory because neutrinos don't interact with matter they just pass through it and even right now billions of neutrinos are passing through my body or your body so this question could have been directly done by elimination and you could have got two marks or you could have done it incorrectly and you could have lost one fourth of your mark so that's why i keep saying please read the question again and again everybody with me read the question again and again at the moment you realize dark matter possesses strong interaction with normal matter it sounds pretty off because if it actually strong interactly with normal matter then it is very easy to find it but it is not easy to find it that's why option number b okay uh recently they have confirmed the presence of dark matter all right this was in news it was in indian express article so you can go and read this article it will further alleviate all your doubts which you have about dark matter they recently confirmed it all right okay let's come to the last question of today question number 10 very easy straight from the ncert all right so 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer anand that's what i'm saying if you wanted to answer that questions you don't know you don't have to know the features of dark matter anand remember if you are giving upsc 2020 to all those who are giving upsc 2020 utilize your common sense more than your knowledge utilize your common sense we are trying to find dark matter if it was that easy to find why would we try to find it we are not able to find dark matter because it is not seen it does not come as naturally as normal matter does so that means option b should be wrong if it is strongly interacting with normal matter like ice if you take in your hands you can see it melting so you know ice is there but for dark matter you don't know where it is existing all right so even when you don't know you can answer this all right question number 10 enough time given it's my humble request to everybody who is appearing for upsc prelims 2020 if your knowledge fails you use your common sense that has been given in abundance by god use your common sense 
70% questions can be solved with your common sense. You can eliminate options by your common sense. All right. Uh, who's answering this question? Nobody wants to answer this. Is it that difficult? There is no difference between dark matter and dark energy are. Okay. Uh, Afreen, it is C. Dheeraj, it is C. Rest, Anant and Naveen and Sivranjani, Ashwat Kumar, Abhishek and Neelam. Yes, it is C. All three are correct. Dev Prayag is Alaknanda Bhagirati. Rudra Prayag, Alaknanda and Mandakini and Karan Prayag, Alaknanda and Pindar. Actually, let's go and see what are the Panch Prayags. So, there are five Prayags. Four of them have been talked in the NCRT itself. So, this is an excerpt from the NCERT. Alright. So, they say that your Ganga starts in the Gomuk uh, region in Uttarkashi district of Uttarakhand. Right. There it is known as Bhagirathi. So, when Bhagirathi meets Alaknanda, it is known as Ganga Deron. Alaknanda has its source in the Satopant glacier above Badrinath. I will show it to you all. So, Alaknanda uh, plus Dholi Ganga. Alright. So, here it is. Sorry, it's here. Okay. Actually, I'll show it to you on the map. It's easierly done here. When you start from Badrinath, you have the Vishnu Ganga. This is the Vishnu Ganga. And this is the Satopant Glacier. So your Vishnu Ganga plus Dholi Ganga combine you to give Vishnu Prayag, which is also Joshi Mat. I have stayed at this place and it is quite a dangerous place to staying at. It's a couple of kilometers away from Badrinath. You move further on Alaknanda, then Alaknanda meets Nandakini, another tributary of Ganga. It is called Nand Prayag not very frequently known. Going ahead, Alaknanda means Pindar Ganga. That's called Karna Prayag, which is already given in the NCRT. And going further, from Kedarnath comes your Mandakini, another tributary of Ganga. So, Alaknanda meeting Mandakini or A plus M is your Rudra Prayag. And finally, Dev Prayag, we all know, when your Ganga uh, Bhagirati meets the Alaknanda, that's your Dev Prayag. And Prayag Raj is when your Yamuna meets Ganga. Naveen, uh, all right. Okay, Abhishek, I'll zoom. Sorry, my bad. I should have zoomed it. Can you see it now, Abhishek? Naveen, attempt at least between 75 to 80 questions. You need to attempt 80 to 82 questions. Why? Because if you attempt somewhere around 60 questions, that means the total marks by which you are attempting the paper is 120, right? If you are attempting only the paper for 120, how are you supposed to get 110 plus marks to assure your seat in mains examination? So attempt the paper for at least 160, 170 marks. Is that okay? So that is roughly 80 to 82 questions need to be done. If you're not able to do, if you're only able to do 60 in the first go, then start applying your brain and using your common sense. But don't do anything less than 75, 80. Otherwise, you're already out of the competition. Clear? This is how it is here. Hang on. So Badrinath, Vishnu Ganga, Dholi Ganga makes your Vishnu Praya. Alaknanda, Nandakini makes your Nand Prayag, Pindar Kanga and Alaknanda makes your Karn Prayag. So everything is with Alaknanda only. Alaknanda and Mandakini makes your Rudra Prayag and Alaknanda and Bhagirathi make your Dev Prayag. And the final Prayag is in Yamuna, uh, Yamuna and Ganga meeting in Allahabad. That is the Prayag Raj. Okay? Everybody good so far? So we'll end the session today here. Thank you. And hope you have a wonderful day. 
आई होप टू सी यू गाइज आर एट थर्टी पी एम टू नाइट ऑन दी अन अकेडमी सेशन अ कपल ऑफ डाउट्स दैट यू गाइज ऑलरेडी हैड आई थिंक अनंत हैड आस्ट मी अ क्वेश्चन रिगार्डिंग द डोमेस्टिकली सिस्टमैटिकली इंपॉर्टेंट बैंक आई विल बी टेकिंग अप दैट क्वेश्चन ऑन दी अन अकेडमी सेशन एंड आफ्टर इन योर डाउट रिगार्डिंग केसवानंदा भारती आई थिंक आई टेक दैट वन अप ऑल्सो दे No, don't leave the paper, Abhishek. I mean, do the math yourself. I have done the prelims. I have attempted the prelims. Do the math yourself. You are attempting the paper for one forty marks, right? If you are supposed to get hundred and five plus, you will do certain questions which are wrong. Also, you have. Yeah, Afreen. Thank you, Amrit Pal. So, Afreen, your doubt. I will take it up in the an academy session. or press or maybe in the marathon sessions but i remember your doubt i will take it up because i want to do it in a little bit more detail so i'll take it up there is that okay and abhishek do the math if you are attempting only 120 marks paper how do you expect to get 110 plus or 105 plus is that okay I mean, because when I attempted the paper, even then I used to do at least 75-80 questions. Because the probability of you getting a correct question, I mean, if you get a question correct, that's two marks. So it is after only getting four incorrect that two marks will be nullified. So what's the probability? The probability is still high in your favor. Got it, Abhishek? Anand, don't do hundred questions. I am not saying go and die or get yourself decapacitated. I am saying take a <laughs> take a uh, what do you say a middle stance, a middle path, as Buddha says. Do seventy five to eighty questions. You will have to push yourself to get seventy five to eighty, and out of them get at least you know sixty correct, so that your score remains uh, good. Is that okay, Abhishek? and is that okay uh, anand yes because do the math yourself if you are attempting uh, only 120 marks paper then sayonara to prelims as abhishek says sayonara sayonara to prelims 2020 it's not happening i can guarantee because you are not gods that you will get all the 60 correct so that's not happening so there is a very less margin remaining so do more questions do at least 75 questions 75 to 80 questions so that you are in the safe zone and do them correctly all right anand abhishek everybody sorted so we'll close for the day is that all so the next session is on saturday and sunday we are having full marathon sessions all right so they will start at 11:30 am 3 to 4 hour sessions we will be doing 50 questions so no session on thursday and friday that is tomorrow and day after then on the weekends we'll have a continuous session so that we can do more questions uh anant do the math yes um okay so anant do the math you the probability of getting 1 and 4 correct is 25% right you might get 1 and 4 correct so and you might get 1 and 4 incorrect also but if you get one correct you're getting two marks however to nullify those two marks you will need to make four incorrect so still higher probability of getting more marks but then the accuracy has to be high that's what i'm saying all right okay i hope i've solved your doubt An uh, Anand. All right. Thank you and have a good day, folks.